Hello, I'm Ned Foley, and I have the honor and privilege to direct the Election Law at Ohio State program. And for those of you who are with us today, you may know the drill because this is uh, one in a series of conversations that we've had since before election day itself, and then afterwards and around the Electoral College meeting in December. And now, obviously, with the confirmation of the Electoral College vote last Wednesday, January 6th, uh, we are taking stock on this whole election season. Um, and when I mentioned the phrase January 6th, of course, images are flooding into my mind as they are, I'm sure, with everybody else. And there is so much to say. Um, but I would like to not say it myself right now, but instead do what we've been doing and turn this over to my great friend and colleague, Steve Huffner, who's the deputy director of our program, who has done such a great job in moderating these conversations we'll, and will do so again today. And I look forward to listening and participating. So Steve, if you're with us, take it away, please. Thanks, Ned. It's great to be with everyone again and uh, to do what we are quite confident now will be the last of these sessions in sort of real time thinking about the 2020 election. Who knows, 10 years from now, we may do a revisitation of all these things and again be talking about the 2020 election, but not in real time. So we're at the conclusion of all of this. And as we've done in the past, we're ready to get the discussion going by inviting each of the participants who are joining us today to just take a moment or two to tell us what is on their minds at the moment, their top of mind reflections about this year's election as of today. And as Ned says, we've done several of these and we've switched up the order in which we've let people express their opening sentiments, sometimes in alphabetical order from A to Z, sometimes reverse by previous almost random agreement. We are gonna to start today with Charles Stewart, who uh, joins us from MIT where he's a professor of political science. And after Charles, we're then going to work through the group of people who are with us today in reverse alphabetical order from Charles. Uh, and again, it's not always the same group, although many of you have been with us for most of these, a few of you for all of these sessions that we've done, as Ned said, going back to October. And I will still try to just briefly introduce each of you as we go in terms of your uh, affiliations. So with that, I'm going to invite Charles to let us know what is on his mind as of this day. Charles? Although I noticed that Pranita has um, shown up um, <laughs> since, <laughs> since we agreed. So I actually, I think she should go first. Well, we didn't give her any warning of that, so we're going to stay with what we planned. All right, all right, fair <laughs> enough. Unless she wants to trump trump me, um, I'm happy to go, Charles. If, all mean, righty, let's do know. it. Let's do it by rule. Um, so okay, top, so so top of my mind, really, I think is um, what inauguration will look like. What uh, does the next week hold in terms of unrest and violence? I, I imagine a lot of people in the audience are also sort of thinking about. Um, what things will look like on the ground. Uh, but also too, uh, the president was impeached yesterday, right? So what does that mean for our political system? What does that mean for um, the future in the beginning of the Biden administration? So quite a few big issues that are top of mind for me. Um, and I'm sure that the, those sentiments are shared by others. Thanks, Fernita. I didn't get a chance to introduce you as being with us as a law professor and uh, Associate Dean from the University of Southern California. Thanks, Fernita. So now we'll go to Charles from the Political Science Department at MIT. Um, and um, yeah, thanks, Steve, and, and thanks, Ned, and, and Jillian as well for um, um, uh, hosting the series of conversations. Has been um, one of the highlights of um, of the past election season. Um, one that's had highlights and lowlights, I have to say. So um, I'm the non um, 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 law professor here. So. Um, I'll focus on some things about policy and politics, about what we're experiencing right now. And um, so two moments, one about kind of a big issue and one about kind of more middle level issues. The big issue is just trying to reflect on what the consequence of the current um, kind of impeachment season um, is gonna have for the big politics of the next um, 
months, couple of years. And that is to say, I mean, I think it, if we're concerned about the state of American democracy right now and the anti-democratic elements that have both arisen in our mainstream politics and then um, kind of gotten a lock hold in parts of, you know, kind of elected officialdom, then it seems to me that one of the things that we want to be on the lookout for is for um, whether or not issues of impeachment, election rules, dealing with um, the aftermath of January 6th um, is going to split off um, anti-democratic elements, um, especially, I mean, to name it, in the, within the Republican Party from um, pro-democratic elements in the Republican Party. I mean, and it seems to me that the, the impeachment vote um, yesterday didn't really do that. Um, it, it, it hived off, um, um, leaving aside Cheney and Rice, um, it really kind of hived off more moderate Republicans who actually might have ambitions in Northern states um, from the rest of the party. But there's still the, the question about the separation of factions that range from Christian millennialism, millennialism um, that kind of sees recent battles as part of a larger narrative all the way over to, to folks who, who see these battles as being strategic ones. And so I think kind of the separation of the sheep from the goats to use another divinity school um, a metaphor is yet to happen. Um, and um, some people think it might, um, but I think it's yet to happen. At the kind of small and smaller level, I mean, I think we need to remember that um, normal politics around elections is happening right now. Um, state legislatures are, are, are in session and um, throughout the country, there are laws being passed um, reflecting on this last, last election. Um, in New York State and Georgia and Wisconsin, you kind of go down the list. And, and so um, when all this impeachment stuff is over, um, I mean, I think um, I'm going to have to find some time to pay attention to that because that actually might be equally consequential to what we've been, what we're talking about in terms of of, of impeachment. And then finally, I'll just note with, that within all of that are relatively minor changes to major changes. And um, I'm looking for not only um, to see whether, you know, um, um, mail balloting laws and those sorts of things are going to be tightened up, but whether state legislatures are going to try to write in um, greater um, uh, roles for them in the future, especially in Republican states. In, um, in the canvassing and certification of elections. And I will remind us all finally that Ted Cruz, um, who was one of the leaders um, in, um, um, in the rejection of um, certified votes last week has also taken a stance against the 17th amendment. And so um, I'm, I'm kind of also interested in how mainstream certain other um, um, movements to return back to the politics of 1789, how far that will go in the next few months. Thank you, Charles. So next up, we'll ask Rip Pildes from the New York University Law School to share some thoughts. Rick? So, so my first thought is we, we have to stop meeting like this. Um, and what I mean by that, though, is not because of the pandemic and meeting on Zoom. What I mean is uh, because we have one major crisis about our elections and democratic system after another. We thought we were going to be done earlier uh, with this. We would not be having to have a fourth session. Um, and my main thought is that uh, the, the country faces really difficult circumstances at this point. Um, what's been on display in recent days most vividly um, is not going away. It's not going away after Donald Trump. It's not going away after this or that politician. Um, there are very, very uh, conspiratorial dark forces which have always had some role in American political culture, um, much more so than a lot of other democracies for reasons we could speculate about. But they're very, very powerful now, uh, fueled certainly by social media uh, to a significant extent. Um, we have learned, I think, in the debate between political scientists over whether uh, voters take their cues from political leaders or whether political leaders are, are, are responding to voters, 
I do think we have learned how much political leadership does uh, affect uh, how these forces get mobilized or don't get mobilized. Uh, and I think that uh, a, a greater focus on uh, political leadership is, is potentially uh, a, a hopeful direction to think about. I think the fundamental task for election reform thought to the extent it can address any of these deep issues is not so much the issues that of course we'll have to talk about with absentee ballots, this measure, that measure, but sort of at a deeper level, um, are there significant changes to the political process, to the election process uh, that are uh, plausible as tools for trying to cabin in and isolate the more extremist forces that are now very significant in American uh, politics. I, I, I can't remember if I mentioned this in one of our meetings early on or in other discussions I was in before the election, uh, but even before all this uh, happened, <clears throat> even before the election, the data showed that uh, something like 25 to 30 percent of both Biden and Trump supporters said that they believe their candidate could only lose if the election was rigged. Uh, the survey data <clears throat> on people's endorsement of some level of violence uh, in the cause of their political ends was shocking. Um, this was all uh, a month or two before the election. So the ground was primed for this. And with poli political leadership prepared to really light a match to it, we've, we've seen what happens. But, but we have to contend with this on an ongoing basis. And, and this is going to be a project of many years, not any kind of short-term uh, solutions. Thanks, Rick. And I'll use that as an opportunity to go ahead and answer just one question that is in the Q&A related to my opening comment about why would this be the last of these sessions? And Rick said, this needs to be an ongoing conversation. And at the same time, we need to stop meeting like this. Uh, all I meant to say is I'm quite confident this is the last conversation this group will have about the conduct of the 2020 election. There may be uh, opportunities to continue to reflect on the implications of the election and, and how uh, these various forces that Rick has just mentioned and others are mentioning continue to affect our political processes. But in terms of the direct analysis of, of this election, we've been tracking things sequentially as different stages of the election have, have occurred. And now we're at the end of that process, but there will still be plenty of need to continue a different kind of conversation going forward as, as Rick just suggested. So now we'll turn to Nate Persley, who's with us from Stanford as a law professor and member of the political science faculty there at Stanford, Nate. You're on mute still, Nate. I thought when you said that, you know, that this would be the last of these kinds of meetings, it's because we would all move into a different field that was a little more uh, pacified, you know, like Middle East politics or something like that. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're stuck here. Uh, I'll talk about very quickly three things that are on my mind. First, the impeachment and everything around that. Secondly, uh, the issues of democracy reform that Rick Pildes hinted at. And then third, uh, living here in Silicon Valley and what was my sort of day-ish job before uh, the COVID impact on the election became apparent, which is the impact of on social media and the, um, the platform policies. First, on the impeachment and other ways of addressing the current crisis, um, you know, I think it was appropriate to impeach the president yesterday. I think that um, the, the, the symbolism has already been achieved. It would be great, better if we had, you know, um, um, a even starker symbolic message uh, that would result in a conviction, even if it's one day before his um, term ends. But uh, I think that, you know, we have, the way I'm thinking about these remedies for our current crisis is to just think about what the opportunity costs are and what the impact will be on, on sort of getting stuff done. Um, I think that whether it's, you know, uh, having a trial after um, Trump leaves office or, or using Section 3 of the 14th Amendment or doing other kinds of moves to try to uh, prevent Trump from running again, um, I think that, all, you know, I'm supportive of, of several of those, but I think that, that I, I believe the Biden folks when they say that they are worried 
that a trial uh, sometime soon after he takes office uh, will uh, make it very difficult for the Senate to um, essentially walk and chew gum at the same time to confirm the appointees and to uh, start you know, on the right foot. And so I think we shouldn't be surprised if Biden plays a role once he is inaugurated as to how the um, any remedy or, or trial would proceed. Second, on the democracy reform agenda, I think that you know, uh, Charles and I had written a piece that still hasn't gotten published uh, because we spiked it once we had once the riots uh, and insurrection happened last week. Um, because you know now's not a time to be talking about ballot drop boxes and absentee ballot signatures when you're talking about the sort of basics of of American government and democracy under assault. Uh, and there will be a time for all that. And my guess is that that time will be in the next year that we will, you know, uh, that Congress, because the Democrats now have control, will consider something like HR1, which has, uh, you know, a buffet of different uh, democracy reforms in it. I, I, my view on I, some of those, some of the things in HR1 are, are good and we should think about them as well as uh, uh, things that, that came up in this election related to mail balloting uh, and the like. But um, I think that the, the, the impact that they're going to actually have on some of the problems that we're seeing in the short term is, is relatively minimal. You can support gerrymandering reform uh, and some other you know, primary reform and the like, uh, as I do, uh, but I don't think that we're gonna, it's gonna respond to our current crisis. There are things that can be done now though it, that are worth spending political capital on like DC statehood, uh, Puerto Rican statehood, and the like that I think would have a, a dramatic effect on, um, you know, obviously the composition of Congress as well as the Electoral College and the like. Final thing, and there's a lot more to say on the democracy reform agenda and what, what should be top of uh, the, that agenda. Finally, just on, on the social media uh, side of this, uh, you know, what, what's happened is because we, we do not have nonpartisan overseers of American politics is that it's, it's fallen to Google, Twitter, and Facebook to be those judges. And so whether it's putting flags on, on statements to, to declare that they're false or that fraud, you know, the claims of fraud are, are um, misleading and the like, or most recently the deplatforming of Trump, um, they have been put in this uncomfortable position of exerting what otherwise looks like state power uh, here to to remove you know to, to control the the speech marketplace. Of course, these aren't First Amendment problems in the strict sense; they're private companies and all that. But I do expect that you'll you'll see um, a lot of action in the both privately uh, and here in Silicon Valley trying to figure out what these policies are gonna be going forward and then also uh, legislatively uh, in, in Congress to see what uh, what should be the new rules uh, that govern these companies and their content moderation policies. Thanks, Nate. Derek Muller from the University of Iowa College of Law. Derek. Thanks, Steve, Ned, Jillian, everyone at Ohio State for hosting these conversations. They've been, they've been really, really beneficial. Um, you know, the, 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 there's, I feel like every day there's another 10 things I'm thinking about, but, but here are the, the, the two big things on my mind have been first, you know, instilling confidence in our election systems and how we can, how that can happen. You know, I think Rick Pildes cited some of that survey data and, um, you know, it, it's increasingly frustrating to see, um, you know, divergent views of how we, we have confidence in our election systems before and after election day and how those views change dramatically depending on your partisan affiliation and, and what happens in the aftermath uh, of the election. Um, it's not a good thing, it's not a good system. You know, Charles has obviously done a lot of research and then comp compilation of, of thinking about what confidence in, in elections means to voters, whether that's adequate funding, familiarity with, with resources, short wait times, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to think about there, but, um, you know, some kind of broad sustained effort, whether it's public education or, or, or whatnot, to figure out how to cure that. And maybe it's incurable. I don't know. I, I hope not, because I think we're in a lot of trouble if that's the case. Um, and learning from this election in particular, but, but you know, we, we've seen the trend moving this direction. Um, you can raise a lot of money uh, casting doubt on the election. And that's not, not a good place for us to be when it comes to thinking about the campaign finance piece in conjunction with the confidence of elections. Um, the second thing, getting at some of the things that Nate was talking about, uh, you know, I think there's going to be some 
so, some novel uh, efforts to disqualify uh, President Trump from, from future opportunities to serve in office, uh, whether it's Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, uh, an impeachment disqualification vote, um, and just thinking about how that spins out over the next four years, what that means in terms of um, you know, con Congress's role versus the court's role, what it means in terms of ballot access rules, campaign finance rules, and the like. Uh, so it, it, to the extent any of these are spun forward, um, there are a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of devil in the details to, to be played out in the years ahead if any of them come through. And I'm starting to think about those things right now too. Thanks, Derek. We'll turn next to Michael Morley from Florida State University Law School, Michael. Great, thank you. So we, we, we've already covered a lot of the waterfront, so I don't wanna repeat what anyone else has, has said. So I'll, I'll just throw out from a little bit of, of something that no one's touched on yet, is that for me, our experience with this election has highlighted just how much of it rests on norms and practices that really have been up until, up until this election cycle, particularly in, in, in recent decades, largely respected by both parties and certainly by both winners and losers of the electoral process. And as hyperpolarization continues, perhaps as the effects of social media continue and the ability to disseminate, right, not only disinformation, but also just to, to right, in, in, inflame people's passions, right, and rile people up and, and, and allow for the right, formation of the, uh, the tragedy that we saw right on uh, last week. I think that, that, that it's really important that we can't, we, can't, we can't rest on fragile norms, that we have to try to move to replace norms with law, right? Everything from what does it mean to assert, you know, for the GSA administrator to ascertain the winner of the presidential election, right? For since largely since the adoption of the Presidential Transition Act, right? That that was large, a matter of norms. It was particularly right where where you had a concession by uh, one of the candidates, right? It wasn't really something that we had to worry about spelling out. This election suggests that we do with the Electoral Count Act itself, right? We could have a whole right, multi-day seminar on the problems with the Electoral Count Act, but you're just most basically, right? It says you can object to a vote if it wasn't regularly given, but that term isn't defined. And the, 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 even the legislative history isn't made clear what that means. So try, right, filling in some of these gaps, filling in some of these details, flight, e canvassing, right? I mean, we, we had a right, canvassing board uh, they run a county level canvassing board. We had members right, refusing to to certify the results of a canvas. Right there, would, there was uncertainty as to whether a state level canvassing board would be willing to approve the uh, 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 approve the state's tallies. So, right, if you look at an election code, right, you'll have you'll have tons of detailed provisions about every step in the process, and then toward the end, just a few broad things, and then you do a county canvas, and then you do a state canvas, and then everything's fine. Right, and that was a, another aspect of the process that historically hasn't really been fleshed out in the code in, in, in many states in terms of what can the boards do, what can't the boards do. So I think if anything, this, this election, our experiences here show us just how fragile the process is. And it's perhaps too fragile to rest just on norms and good faith that we need to take a hard look and supplement where we can with clear, specific, concrete law and not even you know, law up with a partisan valence, just whatever the rules are, it is better to spell them out rather than to just leave it to custom practice norms. You know, the one substantive provision that I would that I would urge would be right erring on the side of transparency, right? Erring on the side of right making more objective information available to the public, right? Allowing the allowing the public and representatives of the public to the extent possible to see what's going on. I know like during the Florida recount, the the actual ballots themselves in many cases like you know, were, were 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 put up on um, not broadcasting, but but basically where anyone in the entire room could see it rather than having like lean over people's shoulders. So right, we have the technology now to facilitate transparency. And I think that that is one effective way of right, fighting back against some of the disinformation and making hard objective facts more readily available to try to combat you know, lies about the, the conduct of the elections or the outcome of elections. Thank you, Michael. So next we'll turn to Lisa Mannheim from the University of Washington College of Law. Lisa. Thank you. Um, 
So I uh, certainly agree with Michael that um, we have uh, a breakdown of norms that we're facing um, at, coming out of this election. We also have a breakdown in the sense of institutions, or at least a threat to, to break them down. Um, and uh, we saw that really vividly, of course, on the 6th, where you had the Capitol building literally breached at that point. Um, and so going forward, one thing that I'm really focused on is how to strengthen the institutions that we have. Um, and I'll just kind of run through a few of them. So one is political parties. Um, it's easy to criticize political parties for introducing various uh, pathologies into the system, um, but actually they're a very uh, effective way of counteracting ex extremism um, and bringing people together. And so various reforms, um, which academics and others talk about at length to little you know, reception generally, um, would help to strengthen political parties, uh, including um, reforms to campaign finance laws, uh, re reforms to redistricting laws. Um, and the like. A second institution relates to the thousands of um, election officials across the country who are the ones at the end of the day who ensured that the 2020 election would run in the way that it did. Um, these are people. These are people uh, for a, a lot of people are working essentially on a volunteer basis. A lot of people do this as jobs. Um, these people, uh, they need resources. They need security. Um, it's also the case that um, uh, there's a, a culture among a lot of these officials, a culture of professionalism, of integrity, of neutra political neutrality, um, and to the extent that we're able to find ways of bolstering that culture, culture going forward, um, that is uh, incred incredibly important. In fact, I would say necessary to have our elections continue to run in a, in a way that, that works. Um, and then the final uh, institution I wanted to flag, I'll actually flag a fourth, but the, the, the third um, uh, institution I wanted to flag um, relates to the courts. And so we had a similar situation with the courts as we did with the election officials. There's a culture there of um, uh, professionalism, of again, of integrity, of um, you know, history uh, and prestige. Um, and as a result, you didn't see the same um, reactions to what is going on, what's been going on in this election in the courts as we saw in other, in other institutions. They provided a backstop, particularly against the disinformation that was swirling around, that still is swirling around. Um, and so these also, I would say, they, they need support. Um, uh, and uh, one thing I want to flag in that end, um, I know that, for example, in Pennsylvania, um, some of the state legislatures, uh, let legislators there are trying to push through reforms that would take um, judicial elections and divide them up by district in, to sort of introduce the uh, gerrymandering process into judicial elections there. That is exactly the wrong way to go, in my view, um, in light of what we're seeing right now. Um, the last institution I just wanted to quickly flag would be the schools. That's outside, I mean, elementary schools at this point, right? I mean, that's outside high schools, middle schools, that's outside of our bailiwick as um, election law scholars. But frankly, what we're seeing is a, a problem with uh, basic civics understanding, with uh, critical thought, with ability to sort of navigate disinformation. And that's got to start at the bottom at some point and, and work its way up through society. So that's somewhere that I think as a, as, a, as a society we really need to be focused on. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Next, we'll ask Rick Hassan for his top of mind thoughts. Rick comes to us from the University of California, Irvine College of Law. Rick? Oh, we're not catching your audio yet. Are you hearing me now? Yeah, that's good. Great. Sorry about that. Um, uh, as Rick Pilda said, uh, we have to stop meeting like this. Uh, I do feel like um, we've kind of reached the limits of what election law can do for American democracy. We're talking about um, changes, and, and I wrote a piece last week uh, at Slate about changes that could, for example, bolster moderate Republicans and try to deal with the Trumpist wing of the Republican Party, at least part of which is not committed to uh, free and fair elections and peaceful transfers of power. Uh, but as um, you know, as I gave interviews in the fall as to what could happen, and I'm sure all of us on uh, this call gave those kinds of interviews and you go down these rabbit holes and eventually I would have to say to the reporter, um, now you've gotten into the realm of civil military relations. Now you've gotten into the realm of uh, what does it mean uh, for people to obey rules? And, you know, I can't tell you that. I can tell you what the Supreme Court has said in cases and how uh, justices would be likely to apply precedent, but if justices don't apply precedent, then we're out of luck. Um, it was the same thing. I think uh, it was Nate that made this point about, uh, you know, what's Mike Pence going to do on the floor of the Senate when he was opening 
the envelopes on, on January 6th. There, there's only so much that election law can do if people are not willing to, co to uh, comply with the rules of the game. And uh, as we're seeing the reporting about the January 6th insurrection uh, and the reporting getting worse and worse, and now indications that there may have been members of law enforcement that were cooperating with those who were engaged in the insurrection, I feel we're at a, a point where there really is a limit to what we can offer. We can structure rules that try to uh, create fair elections and that if people are willing to believe the truth uh, should give assurances that elections were conducted in fair ways. But if you've got a significant part of the population uh, led by uh, someone uh, uh, who is um, spouting lies about the integrity of the election, it turns out that you know it's very difficult to fight against that. And people were willing to give their lives uh, and uh, try to fight over what they saw I think some of them honestly as a stolen election. And uh, I, I just wonder um, what we as the election law community can really offer in that context. Uh, Lisa just made reference to uh, high school civics. And you know, I often go there as kind of, you know, this is, this is where we can go, but our problems are, are so urgent. Um, and our, um, the depth to which some people uh, have gone in, in uh, leaving reality in part fueled by social media disinformation leaves me very concerned. And so uh, I, I worry about the near future, the fact that we have 20,000 troops that have to guard uh, the uh, inauguration, the fact that some people are worried about the troops guarding the inauguration and whether we can trust all the troops. This is not election law anymore, but this is really a potential breakdown of civil society and it, it it, it's what keeps me up at night now. Thank you, Rick. Um, next, we'll turn to Rebecca Green from William and Mary College of Law. Rebecca? Boy, that's kind of a tough act to follow um, because it's so dark. Um, but I'm going to try to pull, uh, pull back from the abyss just a little. Um, you know, as I'm sort of thinking about reform, um, it's hard to know whether this election was a wild anomaly featuring a norm busting president and a global pandemic, or whether what we just experienced is a sort of new normal in terms of the tumult in our system of elections. Um, but I think that either way, um, we need to be careful in thinking about reforms after 2020, um, not to chase shiny things as we approach uh, election reform. I think it's a common ref a refrain, right, that legislating in reaction to a crisis is a mistake because it's too reactive, it's too mired in the specific circumstances of the crises to be able to sort of see the big, bigger picture. I think, you know, it can result in forms that reforms that fail to see um, the forest for the trees, that fix one problem while exacerbating many others. So I find myself thinking about what reform should be prioritized to avoid those kinds of negative externalities. And I think one way to frame this um, is to focus on how the 2020 election exposed gaps. And so really, you know, what I had planned to say was really right exactly along the lines of what Michael suggested. And, you know, I think gaps can take a couple different forms. One, it, the law doesn't cover what transpired at all. So, right, um, it, it could be because we've relied on norms in the past, as Michael suggests, or it could just be that the situation just wasn't contemplated or, or you know, was, didn't exist um, in the past um, as it does in the present. Um, and the second way, I think, is when laws are on the books that are vague or, you know, don't address the situation that arises. And so I think um, looking at a, a, a reform frame that focuses on the gap question, I think, might be helpful. And I know, you know, several people already have mentioned several that sort of fit in this category. But the ones I think about when, when if you're sort of thinking about where are the gaps is, you know, and this is in no particular order, but the ECA is ob obvious, as Michael discussed. Um, obviously, um, absentee voting statutes are a wreck. Um, transparency statutes, it's already been mentioned, but that's one, one place where I feel like um, um, a lot of attention can be spent. And then I'm surprised that Michael didn't mention my last one, which is um, emergency statutes, um, the, the interplay between state emergency statutes and election specific statutes where they exist. Um, but it just seems that those are some ready fixes um, that you know uh, don't address some of the deeper and darker questions that 
Rick um, sort of ended with, um, but, but at least are somewhere where those of us who want to try and be constructive as um, election law people um, might, might put some of our energies. Thanks, Rebecca. So now, uh, next, Ned Foley from Ohio State. Ned. Thanks. Um, so building on some previous comments, um, I think the most urgent question facing, uh, you know, the America's electoral system right now is whether the Republican Party is going to be the, the party of Mitch McConnell or instead the party of Donald Trump. Because if it's the party of Mitch McConnell, it does believe in a conception of democracy where the voters get to decide and the party accepts the results. I think Senator McConnell gave two incredibly important speeches in this cycle. One was on December 15th after the Electoral College vote, and then his speech on January 6th, right before the insurrection occurred, was I think an even more powerful defense of some basic, the most basic fundamental rules of democracy, which is letting the voters decide. So if the Republican Party, and by the way, I think this is at the interest of the Democratic Party and all American citizens, and in some ways I'm building on uh, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's video that many of you have seen. I think this, this is the question, is can the Republican Party be McConnell's party instead of Trump's? And the impeachment vote yesterday shows that that fight is not over. Uh, the, there is still the Trumpism will outlast Trump's presidency and that fight is continuing. Um, and that leads me to think, you know, prior to November 3rd, I thought where we would be now would be conceptually having the Democratic Party, having control of the Senate, control of the House and control of the presidency, asking itself to what extent it was appropriate and how could it impose its conception of fair play and fair elections on the system because it would have the ability to do that. And you know what that would mean, how to go about doing that, but it, this was the moment, use the power and just have a new Voting Rights Act and just have a new reform agenda that would come out of the Democratic Party and its values. I now think that would be a terrible mistake. Um, I'm open to being persuaded otherwise, but I think if, if that's how the reform process goes, it breeds into exactly what Derek was talking about because it will embolden the Trumpian wing of the Republican party to say the system is rigged. It's, you know, it's their system, it's not our system, it's not a shared system, and we're not gonna play by your rules, so we're not gonna play this game. So I think the essential um, principle for reform going forward, and this is gonna be tough for progressives, I think, to buy into, is for President Biden and Senator McConnell, even though he won't be the majority leader anymore, to build a bilateral conception of what America needs by way of an electoral system that both sides can buy into and accept. It, it can't be one side's vision. It can't be the other side's vision. It's got to be bilateral. Um, you know, that means that the left is going to have to give up some of its wish list, but it's for this, but if, you know, if, if we lose the fight for democracy itself, then the wish list goes away. And for reasons that Rick Hassan was suggesting, you know, I think the, the concern is existential enough. It's an important enough that four years from now, two years from now, you know, again, the Republican Party be McConnell's party willing to play by basic norms. So, you know, it, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't have any contact with the Biden administration on this, but I would, you know, the basic just the conversation for me would be for Biden to go to McConnell and say, hey, what do you need from us <laughs> for you to win your fight uh, with Jim Jordan and the Trumpian wing of the Republican Party? Because, you know, it's in our interest uh, for the health of the country going forward that, 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 the, that the pro small d Democratic forces within the Republican Party, as I think Charles talked about it, uh, prevail. So one last point, that leads me to believe that the most important structural issue or reform, and I do think election law still has a, a role to play. I mean, yes, there are social norms, concerns, civics education, all of that is true. But our field election law is the field about what is the, the rules that govern the electoral process. And one set of those rules are the rules about the relationship between primary elections and general elections. And you know, to be primary has become a verb. And you know, we need political science folks, Charles and others to explain you know, the dynamic here, but there is no doubt whatsoever that members of the Republican party who do not wanna be Trumpian 
feel the pressure of a threat of primaries and are constantly dealing with that threat and how that's affecting the process. We saw that even in the last 48 hours related to the impeachment vote. So the first item on the reform agenda should be a diagnosis of this issue. You know, why is it and how is it that the relationship between primary elections and general elections caused this pathology? And once we diagnose that problem from a bipartisan bilateral perspective, then what solutions can we come up with? You know, there are lots of ideas out there on the table, ranked choice voting, top two primary like California has. I'm not at the stage of identifying a particular solution yet. I also think I would rely on federalism and the fact that states can be laboratories of democracy here. There could be an interplay between the act of Congress that sets some baselines for congressional elections in this regard, and then those state laws that, that um, lead into that. We could, have a, we could use the concept of preclearance in a new way. Uh, so the states would, may have to preclear their rules vis-a-vis uh, -vis the federal government to be conforming to certain values. Again, I'm just trying to brainstorm about ideas, but I would say that I would put at the top of the list of the election reform agenda issues, um, how do we solve uh, the problem of, of people of goodwill fearing to being primaried and that distorting uh, American politics? Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Ned. And so Josh Douglas, law professor at the University of Kentucky, I think will be our last person to go top of mind and then we'll see how many questions we can answer and discussion we can have. Josh. Great, thanks Steve and I apologize for uh, joining late at a prior commitment that I needed to be at. So hopefully uh, what I say is not repetitive of what others have said that I wasn't able to hear. Um, but picking up of what Ned said in terms of trying to find a, a path forward between both parties, uh, I think that's a really vital goal, but I also think that we have at least a blueprint of some reforms, of some things that uh, have seen agreement in the states or even in localities uh, between both Democrats and Republicans. And it's not things that the progressive side uh, is going to get everything they want and they're going to have to give, uh, as Ned said. But you know, my own state of Kentucky, for example, passed a new photo ID law last year but it was actually, I think, one of the most mild forms of photo ID in the country. So the Republicans got their photo ID law so they could, you know, say, look, you know, we are able to move the state from uh, where you don't need a photo ID to one where you do. But there's a whole bunch of fail safes in the law itself in terms of if people don't have an ID, they can show a non photo ID and fill out a, a reasonable impediment form but then cast a regular ballot at the polls as opposed to a provisional ballot that a lot of other states have. The kinds of IDs that are permissible are fairly expansive. Uh, and this is a state that is you know, solidly Republican control and yet the, they, they were willing to give in at least some to be able to get the ultimate goal of having a photo ID law uh, while also you know, the, the, for what they got was a uh, lack of litigation. You know, and, and uh, they're the only only lawsuit that came out of it was implementing the, the law for the 2020 election, not on the substance of the law itself. So I think something like that can be a model. And then you also look at what kind of long went along with it, which was a bipartisan agreement between the Democratic governor and the Republican secretary of state about how to run the election, including expanding the use of absentee balloting and early voting. Now, the Republican Secretary of State took a lot of heat from the right of the right side of the party uh, for engaging in that dialogue. But I think the, the overall storyline coming out of the election was that it worked really well. And so uh, if we're looking for ways in terms of reforming this, the process so that the, on the one hand, one side can at least potentially feel more secure or have fewer arguments uh, that they can raise about the possibility of fraud, while at the same time doing so in a way that can expand voter access. I think that's really key. Which brings me to, I think, a broader point about the, the path forward, which is, as an election law community and a, and, and a reform community, do we want to be focusing on improving turnout as an ultimate goal? Because will that sort of lead to uh, a, a um, path forward where the Trumpian side does not have as much of a voice? You know, in the, in the past election, we had almost 70% turnout, which meant that 30% of the voters didn't show up. 
So should that be the goal in terms of improving that? Or should the goal be really more in the structural realm of thinking about the primary system and uh, ranked choice voting or what have you? And, and I don't think those things are mutually exclusive, but I do think the emphasis matters. I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I think it's an important question to ask. Uh, and then the final thing I'll say is that we can't ignore the, the travesty, in my view, of the federal courts in, the, in terms of their pre-election litigation. You know, the courts held up post-election by refusing to question results after the fact. But you had a jurisprudence where I'm not sure Anderson verdict is still good law. Uh, you know, the court didn't overrule it explicitly, but in some ways silently over, seemed to overrule that Anderson verdict test where the states have to provide a justification for burdens on the right to vote and instead do what I call in the new draft, uh, engage in undue deference to states. Basically blindly agreed with, in at least most cases, uh, states running their elections as they wanted, even in the face of a pandemic. And so I think we also have to think about the ways in which the federal courts are not going to be open to claims to make voting easier and are simply going to de defer to the states. And we can't lose sight of that. Thanks, Josh. Even before you made your final point, I was thinking I might invite everybody to reflect for a minute on the role of the courts in this election. There is one question in the Q&A from our audience about the Supreme Court's uh, potential role in this election, asking the question, would it have been better if the Supreme Court had become involved? And uh, my own view is, is no, and I'm open to other people's views on that. But it was asking the question really, as I understood it from the standpoint of thinking about the public perception of the fairness and legitimacy of the election. And that's been a theme a number of us today have talked about, and it seems to me to be a deeply concerning issue is how we do restore more legitimacy and trust in our elections. I also think as a community of people whose field is to think about election law, we can say to anyone who's watching today and is still wondering about it, that there really is no, not only no evidence that this election was uh, not a free and fair election. There's there's no reason to think it was not. It, it, it clearly was in the lights of every sort of standard we have, um, well run, not perfect. No election's perfect, but well run and uh, the, the results are reliable. But the question becomes how do we as a community help people understand that? And that was the basis I thought for this question of would it have been better for the Supreme Court to have become involved. And so with that bit of a, a setup, I'm just curious what other people might have to say about the judiciary's role here in this election and what we might have learned from that. Fernita. So no, I agree with you, Steve, but I also think that the court is uh, plays a role in terms of us being in our current situation, like they, they should share part of the blame. Um, we have both sides this issue of voting on one hand and access to the ballot and election security on the other. And it's not, they're not similarly situated, right? So we are um, a country that likes to use the, the rhetoric of democracy. We've been moving towards being a more inclusive democracy for the last 50 years. Um, and we have, you know, sort of put the constitutional weight be, be behind that in the sense that we've had constitutional amendments that have expanded the electorate. Um, yet this, this idea that um, there's voter fraud and it's extensive and states have an interest in legislating in order to prevent it. Um, we treat that as something that has equal weight as our commitment to making sure that people vote when in fact there's very little evidence of fraud and there are laws in place to address uh, and penalize those who engage in voter fraud. But even the, the sort of the comments that have been made so far, this sense that we have to have this, uh, you know, this agreement that sort of appeases those who believe in election security while also expanding access to the ballot. To me, it, it just seems like a, a odd starting place because it gives credence to this idea that on the election integrity side that, that we have a equal problem there, similar to the problem that we have with, you know, expanding access to the ballot. I, I'm, I'm, I may be in the minority here, but I actually don't think that's a good starting point. I think that to the extent that we are worried about people questioning the legitimacy, legitimacy of this election, we have to stop pretending that there are problems with the legitimacy of this election, right? And, and this is a narrative that has been building uh, really for the, over the last two decades. And so to some extent, we have to understand that some of this, and I think Rebecca made this point, is about the absence of civic education 
uh, people not understanding how the system works, but it's also about us being honest about how the system is working and stop thinking about this in terms of political compromises. The compromise cannot be given credence to a justification that really has no basis in fact. Bernita, thank you. Nate, did I see you? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanna second that. I mean, cause I agree with Fernita and, and I would take it in a different direction, which is to say, it's not as if um, legislation that is going to tr be directed at those concerns are actually going to have the payoff that people think, which is to say that it is not going to lead to um, restored confidence among those people who have lost confidence in the system in the, you know, after November 3rd. And so we should, we should adopt the election reforms that we think are just good election reforms to address problems as they come up or historic problems. Um, but we should not be under the misimpression that it's actually going to um, uh, deal with that particular lack of confidence that we've seen. And, and part of the reason is, is because the, the, the uh, arguments against the election this time were so heterogeneous, right? They extended from everything from Dominion voting systems, you know, and the sort of dead hand of Hugo Chavez having an effect on this election to absentee ballot signatures, to dead people voting and the like. And so it's not as if you're going to say, people are gonna say, ah, well now we've got the, the uh, you know, particular formula that will address those concerns. On the larger question about, about the courts, the courts were incredible. I mean, I, this is a great, time for me to be teaching my law of democracy class and the constitutional law class, because it's sometimes the most difficult thing is, is to um, try to dispel or, or at least speak to the students' concern that the judges are just partisans in black robes, you know, and the fact that you have 60 court cases that were going in one direction from uh, political appointees from, from, you know, whether it's Trump or presidential appointees from Trump to Obama, et cetera, is um, you know a good sign. Now that doesn't mean that there isn't plenty of partisanship or ideological division among the judiciary on critical democracy issues and the like. But but the judiciary behaved admirably. Um, whether the Supreme Court should have come in and and stopped the madness this time, you know, the answer is sure. It would be great uh, if if that's what would have been the result. But you know, once they get involved, you don't know where it's going to go. And so um, I think they probably did the prudent thing, which is to let the let it play out. And then in the courts, there was basically a unanimous verdict from the judicial system. So a related question that at least three people in the chat or three comments in the chat have given rise to that also is directly related to election law as a field is whether lawyers involved in some of the post-election fomenting themselves uh, ought to be subject to discipline or held to account for the way in which these lies about the notion that this election was the result of fraud became the underlying thread for much of the Trump base. What do people think about the role of the lawyers here? Well, I, I think one of the hard things is, you know, I think there's there's probably a spectrum of views you could have. I think there are the lawyers who immediately after election day seeking observer access and some of these questions where the facts were hotly in dispute. Um, you know, I think a lot of people might not be particularly fans of President Trump, but in, in my judgment, at least, there were some some plausible allegations that were, as the judiciary found when it went to discovery, not true, not there, dealing with extremely small batches of ballots. And as we sort of descend, I don't know, it's a little bit like Dante's Inferno, right? As we sort of like descend into late December, early January, uh, many of those lawyers disappeared and you were left with an increasingly sort of more marginal fringe of attorneys, including now, you know, one who's subject to a billion dollar defamation suit from a voting, uh, you know, machine manufacturer. So um, I, I think it's, it, it's worth spending some time thinking about, you know, on the one hand, those who are engaged in sort of party business, the, the sort of robust litigation that happens in the immediate aftermath of, of, a, of a contested election and a lot of fights about the facts on the ground at the moment, uh, up to the much later stages where I think, um, much less defensible positions were continuing to be advocated, including, I think, some of those that, that were, uh, you know, on stage, uh, potentially inciting violence, uh, you know, at the Capitol. So I think 
Um, it, it, it's a hard question. And I think some of these cases, there, there have been referrals requested. A, a judge is holding a hearing in a couple of weeks on one of these cases about whether or not some of the, the lawyers should be referred for disciplinary proceedings. And that's going to be a question that plays itself out in some of the ethics investigations in the, in the months ahead. It is worth noting that I think almost all of the deans of the American law schools signed a letter raising the concern about the role of lawyers, attorneys in the United States in what we've experienced over the last few months now and the obligation that lawyers have to uh, help our public have an understanding of, of our system and to not make allegations that are unsupported by facts. Uh, but let me now invite us to think about the extent to which some kind of reform agenda, I mean, I, I think of our conversation so far as bringing to light two very different but related uh, issues. One is what electoral reforms might be most appropriate and achievable. And the other being this much bigger concern about the nature of our commitments to democracy as a society and what we do to rebuild and extend the, ability, the willingness of citizens to participate and to trust the outcome. But there's a potential relationship there. And so Ned sort of teed up that in part by thinking about the potential for primary reform to make it easier for politicians to be less destabilizing, if you will, uh, with respect to the broader issues of trust in the system. But, but I'd like to just see what other people are thinking right now about uh, what type of reform and, and how aggressive a reform agenda is worth pursuing uh, in order to be sensitive to that larger concern in order to help make progress on that larger concern. Well, I, I guess I'll put this into the mix because I uh, think um, it may be worth some people in the audience hearing this. I mean, I, I think that some of the um, political reforms that have been put on the table by reform groups or reform academics um, could make our, our fundamental situation somewhat worse rather than better in terms of how it affects the role of the extremes um, in our politics. So for example, the, the, we've been talking about gerrymandering reform for a long time. Uh, it's getting more on the agenda now. Uh, I agree, of course, and have argued for years, we need to put this in the hands of, of nonpartisan institutions. Uh, but then the question is, what are they supposed to do? How are they supposed to draw districts? Um, and there's been a lot of advocacy in recent years for one way of determining what makes for fair districting plans, which is based on the outcomes those plans are likely to produce. Um, which uh, is known as the efficiency gap for those of us who know the literature. Um, there's now something called plan score, which uh, proponents of this measure you know, intend to roll out to judge 2020 plans. Uh, but this measure uh, treats it as a fair map if all the districts are going to be won as safe seats by Democrats or Republicans, You know, 75% if Democrats win with 75% of the vote and Republicans with 75, win with 75% of the vote in their districts, that's great on that measure. Uh, it's fair in terms of that assessment. Uh, now, I think uh, it would be far better to put the emphasis on trying to create to the extent possible, subject to other constraints, but trying to create more competitive districts uh, because legislators who come out of more competitive districts uh, have to worry about the general election uh, are more likely to be pulled to the center. And so I worry about assessing the fairness of plans based on a measure that actually kind of creates incentives for creating very safe seats across the board for both parties. That's one thing I think we should keep an eye on and be, and, and be cherry about reform advocacy that doesn't ask these kinds of questions about how it will affect our politics overall. The second, which I mentioned last time, but you know there may be different people on the on the on the, on the call this time. Um, I am worried about small donor-based campaign finance reform with massive amounts of federal matching dollars based on small donor contributions, because 
there's reason to be concerned. I'm not saying this is definitely established. This is a lot in flux these days, but there's reason to be concerned that small donors tend to come more from the polls and give to candidates who are more ideologically extreme. And I, I would like to see us think harder about traditional public financing in which there are government grants to the candidates. Uh, there are difficulties in structuring a public financing system in a way that you know, actually works properly. Supreme Court doctrine has made it even harder. Um, but you know, I, I've been trying to put that uh, on, the, on the table as well. So I mean, I think you know, there are a lot of reforms that are thought about in terms of other democratic values need to be rethought in terms of what, to what extent are they going to be promoting a, a more polarized politics uh, or a more uh, a politics that moves things closer towards the, the center. Um, Thanks, Rick. So we've reached five o'clock and we've already had to bid adieu to Derek and Charles who had events at the top of the hour, but I'm happy to keep going uh, and would like to for anyone else who wants to linger for a few more minutes. So other responses or comments on this line of discussion? Can, let me just reiterate something I said before, which is the house is burning right now. And we are thinking about, there, there are long-term solutions that we can, we can talk about. Um, and we've, we, the, the same debates over those apply, that we've had historically applied to the, there, but, but we have, we have a, a emergency situation right now and the goal should be to embolden those moderate Republicans who are who are willing to, in the short term, um, uh, work with you know the Democrats uh, and and um, you know wh whether it's through electoral calculations like primaries or to as I've said you know to change basically the makeup of Congress. Uh, those are the things that we need to think about. But remember that a lot of these long, whether it's gerrymandering primaries or campaign finance reform, the, the existing makeup of Congress, right? People have, have staked out positions, right? And so it, um, a lot of the, the kind of change that would be uh, effectuated by these kind of small reforms would um, have to take, you know, 10 years or so uh, to play out just because um, you know, you're not going to eat, you know, you, the, the, the candidates, um, uh, the, the incumbents uh, who have been elected under the previous system are not so easily going to then become compromisers if they've been hardliners up till now. Um, yes, it's true that if, you know, with primary reform, maybe that, that if people are not looking over their shoulders to see if someone uh, is going to um, run from the right, that that might be uh, ameliorative in some way. But I think that even that, we shouldn't overstate the significance of that. Yeah, um, you know, I know there, there were also some questions in the chat, uh, many of them about impeachment or about the 14th Amendment, which are quite um, important questions that are at top of mind for many of us now. They're less overtly election law. I mean, they're clearly about democratic government and the constitutional law and the health of the Republic and so forth. Uh, there is a question in there still about um, what really Congress's role on January 6th was and is. Uh, and I'd be eager to invite anyone who wants to tackle any of those sets of questions in terms of where we are today in a broader sense, if you wanted to be responsive to some of the audience questions on those points. I will just say with respect to the congressional role on January 6th, uh, for the benefit of, or, of some in our audience, that there is a potential substantive role for Congress on that day in the unusual event that a particular state has been unable to make clear to Congress what that state's electoral outcome is. And that's when you could see Congress, in fact, substantively have to engage in figuring out what to do with that state. But barring a kind of competing slates of electors from a given state or real uncertainty about what the state has officially said is its choice with respect to its presidential electors, then the role of Congress is purely a ministerial one, 
to tabulate the votes in an official way. We know what those votes are. It's not that it resolves some previously unknown fact of our election, but it makes it official. So that's where Congress is on January 6th, but not to try and now undo the certified results of a state where there is no um, uncertainty in the state. All right, what else would people like to say as we wrap up in the next five or so minutes? Uh, um. Well, I'll just jump in real quick and, and say, I, um, I think it's obviously essential that there be a baseline commitment of voter participation and access to the ballot. And that if we have improper disenfranchisement of, of citizens who are entitled to the equal right to vote, that should be unacceptable. And so I think we always have to be concerned about voter suppression of any kind, particularly when it's done for really nefarious um, partisan motives. And we've seen a lot of that. Um, you know, we have the pathology of gerrymandering for partisan advantage. We've had the um, pathology of trying to utilize voter ID laws and other things purely for partisan advantages. But I also think as, as much as we have to be vigilant to that, we also have to recognize the other stresses and challenges to the system. And, and, you know, and, and as, as Nate said, we, you know, we're in a crisis moment and how do we get out of the crisis? So for example, going into November 3rd, the state that I was most worried about, about from a voter suppression um, perspective was Texas, because they were, they were most hostile. Um, I mean, maybe some other states too, but of a big states, you know, potential battleground states, most hostile to allowing people to have uh, you know, easy access to absentee voting because of COVID. And it, just, and it just seemed like the apparatus of the government was in hyper voter suppressive mode from their attorney general and so forth. And I don't have the, 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 the turnout for the figures in front of me, but I think turnout in, in Texas was through the roof. Uh, now it may have been even higher if there hadn't been voter suppression, but I think if we're honest and impartial in our analysis, um, maybe those voter suppressive efforts were not successful in that it was a, you know, it wasn't a perfect election, but it was, did it meet some adequate measure of access such that the result is authentically free and fair? The same thing I think you can ask, ask about the Georgia November election and then Georgia runoffs. Um, you know, and if, and even if they're, so the, the, neither of those electoral systems would have been run the way the Democratic Party would have run an election uh, if they were in control with Democratic Party values. But clearly Democrats were able to win the Georgia runoffs and win the Georgia presidential race in November, even a regime that was uh, controlled by Republicans. Now, you know, maybe Republican Brad Raffensperger is not, you know, Kemp, although Kemp is governor, signed the certificate. And, uh, and yet, obviously, we could say a zillion things about Georgia this year. And again, I don't want to cater to distrust that is not based in reality. But I think we, I, I think, you know, if, if a significant portion of the Republican Party voter base is, you know, completely living on a different planet in terms of the truth about elections, that is a serious problem for all of us. And we have to solve it one way or, or the other. And I don't know that we solve it by saying that the first important, uh, you know, priority is a, is, is, you know, a wish list of, um, again, you know, one of the things that I think contributed to the toxicity of the, this year from the beginning was just how aggressive there was on the left to try to use litigation to change the rules. This was happening before the pandemic, it happened afterwards, right? So Republicans hate what they call ballot harvesting. There were, there were litigants who wanted to eliminate state laws that prohibited you know, ballot collection, ballot harvesting, because the litigants wanted a set of rules that were more preferable uh, from their perspective. The other side went ballistic and the whole system almost fell off the rails. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, reflection that we should be doing about exactly what is a reasonable set of rules that both sides can agree with, even if neither side gets everything that they want. Lisa, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, uh, Ned and I have had this conversation before and um, I think it's a really important conversation. I think it's a hard conversation. And I guess what I would say in response is that um, 
the I would not personally agree with the framing of what you just described. So um, there were democratic aligned uh, lawyers who were challenging laws as being overly burdensome uh, to the right to vote uh, in a pandemic, uh, which of course made everything more burdensome. Um, the laws you're referring to that were particularly controversial are laws that allow um, people to gather absentee ballots and then deliver them all together. To my knowledge, there's no evidence to suggest that this leads to um, uh, 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 voter fraud, um, but there is evidence to suggest that this may increase voter turnout. Um, one side says because this helps to increase voter turnout, we think that the laws require the states to implement it, even if the states won't do it on their own. Uh, the other side says, no, we're concerned about voter fraud and we can't cite anything. And if you were to push maybe all of the people who are advancing those claims, if you were to push them and to say, hey, you know, there's no evidence of this, why are you really doing this? Eventually they'd say, well, we think that lower turnout in this context helps our candidate. Uh, these are not the same positions. It's true that one side, the, the each side thinks it helps their candidate, but they think it helps their candidate for fundamentally different reasons. One is because it gets more people voting, the other is because it gets fewer people voting. Um, and, uh, the problem here, we've seen this problem for decades. This has been a dynamic that's been going on for decades. Um, one of the things that has become particularly problematic recently is that frankly, the lie that undergirds the voter suppressive side of this argument, that lie has grown on its own. And now there is, people are under the impression that there is fraud that doesn't exist. This lie has been in, in sort of, again, growing for so long, it's gotten out of control. And so at this point, I'm pretty resistant to um, efforts to kind of act like the same thing's going on. It's not the same thing. The arguments aren't the same. The factual basis isn't the same. Um, and I think continuing to sort of acquiesce into that is itself potentially a problem. Thanks, Lisa. Oh, okay. I'll just, so I'll just point out, this is a good example of how impossible it is to find any kind of common ground so here's an issue that Rick has, and of all people, you know, a pretty, pretty supportive voting rights scholar, you know, has argued um, is a problem, and um, he is not in favor of policies that permit ballot collection, uh, you know, broadly by people who are not members of the family of, of the person involved and the like. Now, I'm not saying he's right, but I find it very interesting that just one suggestion like that, that is actually supported by liberal policy experts in this area, uh, immediately triggers such kind of vehement resistance. And, and I think it's just, that's just a little sign uh, of how really, really difficult it is going to be to find common ground on policy reforms. Thanks, Rick. Um, I something really quickly. Uh, just a response to that, it totally makes sense. But what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to emphasize is that alluding to things that simply don't exist, I think that is what sort of has gone on for a long time. Rick has never sort of alleged completely baseless um, fraud, suggestions of fraud. It's that part of it that I think is really but, problematic. But ballot harvesting is what happened in North Carolina District 9 that caused the whole election to have to be rerun. I mean, you say these things that we don't have any evidence. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not in favor of these. You know, laws. I'm not actually. I don't feel I know enough uh, to actually have a position. But I do think we have to be honest about what we know. Um, and I agree that in-person fraud. There's no evidence of any significant levels of in-person fraud. We also know that when we have had problems with fraud, and that they haven't been extensive, but they have been in the absentee balloting process. You know, we had a Miami mayor's race that was totally corrupted in the mid 1990s by massive absentee ballot fraud as found by the courts. We have that example from North Carolina District 9. So, you know, I do want us to be honest on both sides about this. Um, I, I think there's a difference between claims about in-person voting fraud and claims or concerns, let's say, uh, about making sure we can figure out ways <clears throat> to protect the integrity of the absentee ballot process. Um, and, you know, I've said this before, but my own view is in terms of expanding convenience voting, uh, I much prefer expanded early voting that's in person uh, because it doesn't raise some of these kinds of debates uh, and perceptions, um, uh, including perceptions by, uh, from the left, if absentee ballots are rejected um, at, at rates that become troubling uh, or are rejected because they come in late because of postal service delays and the like. So, I mean, we could have both, 
but but a lot of the discussion has been focused because of the pandemic on the absentee option. And, and I really uh, would like to see more emphasis on expanded early in-person voting, which we also did have in this election. Um, and I think is a, a better direction to go for expanded convenience voting. Um, anyway, I want to kind of leave with that thought, I guess. Uh, well, well, I guess one thing, if, if I just have 30 seconds, which is that I think we also have to think about the political realities of passing a lot of these things. I have a whole suite of reforms I'd love to see if, if I could control the world, but the reality is that we have to get a lot of these, you know, there, there's a lot of Republican controlled states. And so something like early voting over absentee might be more palatable. Um, and, you know, piggybacking on Ned's point uh, from earlier, I, I think to have greater legitimacy, we shouldn't sacrifice core principles about the importance of democratic participation and the right to vote. But we, we also need do need to recognize the political realities or, or we're, the, the two sides will just never be able to talk to each other at all. You know, I think we also have to think about how we can enlist election administrators uh, who have very strong interests in running elections that are respected as fair, open, accessible, and with integrity. Um, they certainly like early voting, as far as I know, early in-person voting, because it takes the pressure off election day voting. Um, and, and they can be significant allies in moving, as they have been in some states, right? Uh, in, in, in moving some of these sort of smaller scale reforms that we've been talking about? Well, uh, I think we ought to try and, and wrap up. Uh, I will observe, you know, Ned and I were part of an American Law Institute project that included thinking about sort of best practices for absentee voting that predated the pandemic and the pandemic changed the whole dynamic in which mail-in voting was occurring and it's worth having the kind of discussion that we really are just beginning here at the end of our um, hour and a quarter today and continuing this discussion going forward. And, and we will, I'm quite sure. Uh, and, and our obligation as election law scholars is, is to help everybody involved, the policymakers, the public, really understand uh, what's at stake and what we, un and what we know to be true and what is not true. Uh, and that's true in a broader scope as well. It's not just about the mechanics of the election, but it's true about the underlying claims about our democracy. And I, I really hope we can all take to heart the theme many of us touched on today that Lisa put quite pointedly about the need for civic education, civic understanding and civic commitment to be built among our fellow citizens, even from elementary years, I think is what Lisa said. So uh, with great appreciation to each of you for being part of this uh, and for all of you who are still here to have stuck with us for an extra 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, happy 2021. I, I really look forward to seeing all of you again and, and having conversations like this. Uh, but I think I'm going to assert that the 2020 presidential election is over. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good note, I think, to end on. We clearly have to thank Steve for moderating, not just today, but all of these. And uh, um, as he was saying, we'll, we'll continue to have conversations. I hope that our election law program here at Ohio State can, can be a constructive force as we think about the future. But as Steve was saying, um, the feature of these conversations has been top of mind brainstorming, just, just throw ideas around as we were living through this election in real time. And you know, hopefully that phase of the process is over. And as we think about the reform agenda, you know, maybe what we should be doing in addition to occasional brainstorming sessions is, is structured uh, conversations more typically, you know, with pan even in a Zoom world with panels and presentations and so forth. So um, we're thinking about that if people have suggestions for what we can do here at Ohio State to be uh, most helpful as we continue to improve our democracy and maintain our democracy, we of course welcome hearing suggestions. So thanks, Steve. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to our audience and happy 2021.